Hello everyone, welcome back. We will continue with Spring interview question answer series for 1 to 3 years of experienced developers. In case you missed the first part, please check it out from the top right corner of your screen. So without much delay, let's start. First question is, what is the Spring Beans life cycle? Spring Bean is a class whose object will be managed by Spring Framework. It is also known as Managed Bean. Its life cycle involves many stages from the creation to its destruction. First stage is instantiation. At this stage, Spring creates an instance of the bean. It's like creating a new object which will be managed in Spring IOC container. Next stage is to populate the properties. Spring sets the bean properties using dependency injection. It can be via field, constructor, setter or interface based injections. During this stage only, Spring will check if bean implements bean name aware interface. If yes, then it calls setBeanName method on the bean during container initialization. The setBeanName method receives the assigned ID or name of that bean. Now the bean knows its own ID within the Spring context. At the same stage, Spring will also check if the bean implements bean factory aware interface. If yes, then it calls setBeanFactory method on the bean during container initialization. With this, the bean becomes aware of the bean factory that created this bean. This allows the bean to interact with the container and access other beans. Next step is pre-initialization. A bean can be modified before it is initialized. That can be done using post processors like at the rate post construct annotation. Next step is initialization. At this stage, a bean is initialized. During initialization, the bean is prepared for use. This involves setting up any necessary properties connecting to the database or performing other setup tasks if required. Similar to pre-initialization, we have another stage which is post-initialization. And in this, bean can be modified after initialization as well. After all these stages, bean becomes ready to use and can be injected or used in the application. The last stage is destruction of the bean. When we want to unload the bean and application context is getting shut down, Spring calls the pre-destroy methods for cleanup activities. If you want to learn more about bean lifecycle in detail, please check out the video from top right corner of your screen. Now moving to the next question. Next question is, what are the different scopes of a bean in Spring? In Spring, bean scope defines the lifecycle and visibility of bean within the application context. We can define beans with different scopes in Spring. First is Singleton Scope. A singleton bean is created once and shared across the entire application context. It remains in memory until context is destroyed. If no scope is defined explicitly, then this is the default scope of beans in Spring. Then we have Prototype Scope. In this, a new instance of bean is created every time it is requested. These beans are not shared and are suitable for stateful components. Next we have request scope. In this, a new instance of the bean is created for each incoming request. And the bean is available only during that request processing. Once the request processing is complete, bean is also destroyed. We also have session scope. In this, a single instance of bean is created per user session and remains available throughout the session's lifetime. As soon as user session is invalidated or expired, the bean will also get destroyed. Now if we want the same bean instance to be available at global level like at the application context level, for that also we have a scope which is application scope. One last type of scope is WebSocket scope. Beans having this scope configured are available during WebSocket communication. The most important part is choosing the right scope based on application's requirements and required behavior of the beans. If you want to learn more about scopes in detail, please check out the video from top right corner of your screen. Now let's move to the next question. Next question is, what is the difference between component, repository, service and controller annotations? If we talk about from the point of scan auto detection and dependency injection, all these annotations are same, but they are different on some other points. Let us see the first one which is at the rate component. This is a general purpose stereotype annotation indicating that the class is a spring component. 
Special about this annotation is that component scan only looks for at the rate component in the class path and not the other three annotations. They are also getting scanned because they themselves are annotated with at the rate component. Controller, service and repository are specialized type of component annotation. That is why component scan picks them up and register their following classes as beans. If we define our own custom annotation and annotate it with at the rate component, it will also get scanned with component scan. Component scan is a process in which Spring detects classes marked with the specified annotations and makes them available on Java class path. These scanned classes are registered in application context and are used for dependency injection. So overall this annotation serves as a generic stereotype for any Spring managed component. There is no specific layer associated to this annotation and it is often applied to utility classes, helpers and other shared components. The next annotation is at the rate repository. This indicates that the class is a data repository. That is, it will be responsible for database related operations. Special about this annotation is that in addition to making a class managed bean, it is used to catch platform specific exceptions and rethrow them as Spring's unified exceptions. When we use Spring's data access technologies such as JDBC or JPA, this annotation helps in catching platform specific exceptions, for example, SQL exceptions, and rethrow them as Spring's unified unchecked exceptions like data access exceptions. This simplifies exception handling in your application. So overall, this annotation is used for the persistence layer. It provides automatic exception translation, for example, SQL exception to data access exception. The next annotation that we have is at the rate controller annotation. The dispatcher scan the classes annotated with at the rate controller and detects what all methods inside those classes are annotated with at the rate request mapping annotation. Using at the rate request mapping, we can define different endpoints using which external third parties can connect to the application. We can use at the rate request mapping only to those classes which are annotated with at the rate controller. It will not work with the classes only annotated with at the rate component service or repository. We cannot switch this annotation with any other like at the rate service or at the rate repository even though they look same. So overall this annotation is associated with the presentation layer usually Spring MVC. It handles HTTP requests, interact with the views and manage user input. It is also responsible for mapping requests to the appropriate methods using at the rate request mapping. The last annotation is at the rate service. At the rate service bean holds the business logic and call methods in the repository layers. This annotation is intended for the service layer. It represents business logic components. It can include transaction management using at the rate transactional annotation. Now let's move to the next question. Next question is, should we use at the rate auto wired for dependency injection in our Spring Boot applications? Using at the rate auto wired in Spring for dependency injection is a very common practice. Although it makes the developer's life easy for short term, but it has more serious implications in the long run. Using auto wired annotation can lead to the tighter coupling between your classes and Spring framework making it harder to switch to another dependency injection framework if needed. Also, it breaks the principle of immutability, as the dependencies are not final and can be changed. In the latest Spring releases, the use of auto-wired annotation is discouraged. Next question is, what is the use of Spring Data JPA? Now, database is an integral part of any application and we need to communicate with database from our application multiple times to read, insert, delete or update the data. For all these operations, our application need to connect with the database, execute the action and close the connection. If we are not using any particular solution, then managing these steps can be cumbersome. So to handle database operations, we have a specification defined in Java, which is known as JPA or Java Persistence API. It provides a standardized way to manage relational data in Java application. In this, our application do not communicate with database components like tables to manipulate the data, but uses an object relational mapping framework such as Hibernate. In this, our application will have an entity directly associated to a database component. 
let's say we have a table orders in the database so in our application we will have a class name orders which will have all the fields which are actually representing different columns of the database table so any operation that needs to be performed on the orders table in database our application will perform the same on objects of orders class orm framework such as hibernate will make sure that all these changes we did in our class the corresponding changes in the database tables are also done spring data jpa acts as a bridge between our application and hibernate that allows us to focus more on business logic by leaving all the nitty gritties of database operations to spring data jpa spring data jpa is a higher level abstraction built on top of jpa it simplifies data access by providing convenient interfaces and methods for common database operations it doesn't work independently it relies on jpa provider which in spring boot is hibernate now let's move to the next question which can be related to your previous question itself so as we know spring data jpa relies on a jpa provider so can we change the default jpa provider in spring boot from hibernate to some other provider in spring boot application the default jpa provider is hibernate when we use spring data jpa then by default it integrates with hibernate under the hood if we want to use different jpa provider for example eclipse link is there which is similar to hibernate we can exclude hibernate and include the desired provider in your project's dependencies so this is how we will update the existing dependency of data jpa in pom.xml we will add an exclusion markup tag in that we will mention hibernate entity manager this will remove the hibernate from the default jpa provider after that we need to add the details of new jpa provider which we want to use so for eclipse link we need to add dependency markup tag with group id and artifact id of eclipse link we can use maven repository to search for the correct group id and artifact for any dependency we are looking for for any previous or current versions that's the only change we need to make after this spring data jpa will start using eclipse link as jpa provider to communicate with the database in the same way it was happening using hibernate earlier so that's it for this video i hope you find these questions and their explanations useful the level of difficulty in this video was little more than the previous questions we covered earlier please let me know in the comment section if you have any queries or how we can make it more interesting if this video helped you gain new concept knowledge or refreshed your existing knowledge don't forget to like share and subscribe Also press the bell icon because we are going to have many such interesting sessions which can help in clearing spring developer interviews. Once again, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Till then, happy coding.